Sharing the story is going to make me feel the most vulnerable I've ever been in front of a camera. It is a story where I'm talking about my worst experience in a foreign country. But it's also a story of how that worst experience has actually transformed into what I'll call a blessing. It's a story of how I've transcended from this to this. I feel like for you to understand the story, I need to rewind a little bit. You see, I'm from Nigeria. By size, Nigeria is the largest country in Africa in terms of population. We have a population of over 200 million people. Coming from a populous country means that every year we have a lot of students who want to study in the university. So after high school, I applied to different universities, but I got rejected. And after two years of applying, I decided to come to Ukraine. In 2010, I came to Ukraine to study in Kharkiv National Medical University. As a freshman in college, I was actually very passionate about studying medicine and with my desire, burning desire to become a doctor, I was actually very ac active in school and classes and stuff like that. One day, I was coming out of the subway, going to the university for some lectures, and I met this guy called Mark Adamski. Mark, he's a Ukrainian. While I was back home in Nigeria, I had watched some of his videos on YouTube, and I and Matt be began to chat. Mac actually told me of his plans to do some projects in the university and how he wanted to integrate foreign students to some of his extracurricular projects. So one day, Mark was organizing a charity event. I and Mark, as usual, we were hanging out and he said to me, Joseph, do you mind stepping in front of a camera and helping me promote my charity event? He proposed me to sing the song Mad World by Adam Lambert. And that was how, for the first time in my life, I stepped in front of the camera. Hello everyone, my name is Joseph. I'm student of first course and studying medicine in Kharkiv National Medical University. And I'm glad to participate in charity program of new medicine. I think I should just express my donating attitude or my charity attitude in this song by Adam Lambert. It goes this way. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, worn out faces. Bright and early for the daily races. I'm going nowhere, going nowhere. And the tears are filling up the glasses. No expression, no expression. At my head, I wanna drown my sorrow. No tomorrow. No tomorrow. That was actually my first time speaking in front of a camera and Mark enthused after and said, Oh Joseph, you have a very great energy in front of a camera. I would like to be filming with you. And that was how I and Mark started to work together. And we would literally film anything going on in the university, like the university pageants, um, some flash mob, literally anything. Wow, interesting dance show that was. I was really impressed. I was I lost. Think this is the first time an African yeah. girl is participating in Miss Kiana competition. Of course. Yeah. So, sure. what initiated your motive? Okay, of, um, at first, my friend. Then one day, I had an idea. Looking back now, I would say that was the idea that sparked the lights. On the night of April 14, 2014, 276 girls were kidnapped by an Islamic terrorist group called Boko Haram in Nigeria. And that sparked a global outcry with the campaign Bring Back Our Girls. Several activists around the world were actually making campaign videos with the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls. I was actually inspired to do this also for these girls. 
So what did I do? A freshman in college with just a simple idea. I went around the university lecture halls and I was telling each, announcing to all the students, in the next two days, I'm gonna organize a campaign. I need everyone who has a sincere heart, who is against terrorism, who is against um, kidnapping of girls to come out and show their support for those girls who were, who were kidnapped. And surprisingly enough, two days later, I and Mark showed up in front of the university and we had over 150 students waiting, waiting for us. And that was how we made the video campaign bring back our girls. Hello everyone, this is Kharkov National Medical University and we are here, it's no news that 276 girls were kidnapped two weeks ago by Islamic terrorist group in Nigeria, in the northern state of Nigeria, named Boko Haram. Now when we posted that video, that video gained a lot of global support. I would actually say that that video experience gave me this kind of initial motivation. After that, I then had another idea to launch an event whereby foreign students and Ukrainian students will be able to interact because I came into the university and saw that one of the first things I saw was that Ukrainian students and foreign students were not interacting. So I set about to change that. So I created a talent competition which foreign students and Ukrainian students could compete. I announced that the winner was going to get an equivalent if transaction rate at the time was about $200 and the second prize was going to get about $100 and the third prize was going to get $50. My plan was that, okay, people would register for the registration, they were going to pay something of an equivalent of $4 and if we had, for example, 50 people who registered, it meant that we already had the prize money for the winner. That was my third. So when we announced one day before the start of the show, the student government called me and were like, only 13 or I don't know, maybe 15 people, only 13 people had registered. I was like, wow, how are we going to get the money to pay for the winner, to give for the winners the runners up and everything like that. And one of them in the student government said to me, maybe we should just cancel the event. And I was like, no. I'm not going to look responsible for announcing something, promoting something, and then cancelling it a few hours before the commencement of the event. So one of them, we sat down, brainstormed together, and we thought that maybe we could ask one of the agencies which were in charge of admitting students into our university. And that was how I and the leader of the student government decided to go to the head of this organization, this agency, and spoke with the CEO. Surprisingly enough, the CEO agreed to sponsor the event. And we did the audition, we did the semi-final, we did the final. And on the final day of the show, the CEO of the agency, which agreed to sponsor the event, walked up on stage and said, I'm so glad we are able to do something like this to our university and I'm so glad the winner, I'm able to finance this project. But next time, the winner is not going to get just $200, but $2,000, I mean an equivalent of $2,000. You could literally hear the hall go silent for a few seconds. Everyone was astounded. Even me, I was actually astounded. But what was actually going through my mind was that, wow, I started this idea from my bedroom and now it's about to become the biggest show in my university. While I was organizing the show, I had an idea to actually help people. One of my habits is that when, I, when I'm an enthusiastic about something, I begin to consume materials about that thing. At the time, I was reading a book called Pencils of Promise how an ordinary person can create an extraordinary change. The author, Adam Brown, is also the founder of the organization called Pencils of Promise, an amazing organization which has helped several thousands of children build schools. And then I also started to watch videos of Adam on YouTube. And there was this particular video I saw where he made an interview. 
Adam said something quite remarkable. I could see that this idea that you can't actually change somebody's life, that you're too young, you don't have enough money, or you're not in a, a position of, of power and influence is actually ridiculous. It's, it's a broken idea and it doesn't exist. Um, you can provide one small act to one individual person that can really change the trajectory of their life. And I was like, wow, I'm going to go ahead. This is not going to be a one-time thing. This is going to be my life's mission. In the beginning of January 2015, precisely on the 25th of January 2015, was when I got attacked. What actually happened was that, in this period, my friend invited me to play the piano for his concert they were having at church. And he proposed to me that I should be among one of the backup pianists for his events. So on this particular night, it was quite around 10, 11 p.m. I was walking, actually I was alone on this night, and this man came behind me with a bottle of beer and hit me. And immediately he hit me on the head, this part of my head, I fell to the ground. And as I fell to the ground, the first thing he did was that he started to punch my eyes. He would punch my eyes for a couple of seconds that I, what I did see were flashes. And as he was punching me, I was screaming, crying for help and tried standing up, but he would kick me, kick my internal organs. And he just kept doing all that stuff. And then I tried standing up. I'd actually lost a bit of my sense of balance because of the impact the bottle had made to the right side of my ear, of my head. I tried standing up and walking a little bit, running a little bit, because I actually did see another man coming from the opposite direction. So I ran towards him and was like, please sir, can you help me, can you help me? And the man, I remember this man, the first thing he did was punch me even further. I mean, this up, upcoming man, this man coming from the other direction. And on this day, I literally felt like it was a day I probably would have died. Both of them started punching me. They would punch me to the extent that I could literally feel my soul leave my body. I was shouting, asking for help, but it seemed like my voice was falling into deaf ears. They punched me and my jacket was soaked with blood. After a while, I went into coma because I remembered, I just remembered, what I remembered further was waking up and seeing that everything I had on me was gone. With blood over me, all over me, I literally couldn't really see much and with my eyes swollen. I remember seeing the police car and walking up to it asking for help but the police wouldn't even help me then i s remember seeing a small kiosk open and asking the woman there for help and she wouldn't even help me then i said to myself okay i'm probably gonna have to walk home because walking home actually the place i was attacked to my house was about 25 minutes walk by a walk of 30 minutes so while I was walking home, I had this idea that I should probably go to one of my friends who lived not far from me. Because if I would go home, I would probably bleed to death. And I went to his street and I shouted, Pavel, Pavel, help me, help me. He actually thought I was drunk initially. So when he came out and saw that I was soaked in blood, he called the ambulance immediately and I was rushed to the hospital. And the doctors performed several scans on me, x-ray, 
so many things and started to stitch me up. But the most difficult part was not the physical trauma I experienced. The most difficult part was the emotional experience and the mental trauma I had to go through afterwards. I remember sometimes while I was walking on the street, I would do some very strange things like talk to myself, which I had never done before. Sometimes during classes, I would actually start weeping, literally start weeping during the break. And actually, a moment I wouldn't even want my enemy to relieve. I just don't understand how people can be so heartless. Sometimes I, I sometimes I, I I wonder what goes through people's mind to be able to hurt someone and even kill them, you know. Also in this moment, February 2015, started the war between Russia and Ukraine. And that meant that in less than a couple of weeks, the Ukrainian currency dropped by almost four times its value. And I, on one hand, was going through an emotional traumatic experience and the economy was literally crashing. How could I start an organization in this period? I remember one afternoon, we were having lectures in class and we had a break and I was crying. I went to the corner, was crying, think, relieving, thinking of the traumatic experience that, that, I just ex that had just happened to me. And while I was going through this deep moment, a voice said to me, you can either let your pain stop you or you can keep moving forward and use your story to bring other people out of your pain. You see, just like a pregnant woman who goes to her greatest pain before delivery, I believe that I was about to birth something which the world, which would literally affect lives around the world. So I decided to start the organization. You see, it was never a perfect moment, but I knew that I didn't have to wait for the perfect moment, but I, I had to move and make the moment perfect. So I started the organizations. Yeah, we had naysayer. We had people who told me that there was no way it was going to be successful. You're starting in the worst economic time. No one is going to listen to you or help you in terms of donation and stuff like that. Surprisingly, in our first year, we achieved our goals. After our second year, I literally began to feel to do something whereby I was able not just to help people physically, but to help people mentally. And that was how I got the idea to start the talk show whereby I would in invite people, guests who have been through difficult situations and have them share their stories in front of a live audience. And that was how I brought the idea for the Inspired Talk Show. While I was doing the show, I knew that I had to continue to do the work which I started in the last two years, which was also to help people. So I used the show also as a platform to help people. It's a check for an amount of 10,000 grievances. This year, 2020, we set out to do a show about love, relationship, and families. 
the reason I actually decided to do this particular show was because looking in Ukraine, I saw that one of the biggest problems was relationship. Nearly every person I had had either had their father or mother divorced from one another or living in with the second man or something like that. I just saw that there was an outcry for something where people should be educated about having a long-term relationship. And we started filming in January. Everything was great. And then the coronavirus happened. Overseas, the wife of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tested positive for the coronavirus. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he has tested positive for coronavirus. A team of Chinese medical experts arrived in Rome overnight, bringing their experience in dealing with the outbreak. Social distancing is an essential step in preventing the spread of the virus. And it meant that we couldn't actually have people gather together to do an event. And then I had this idea to create blogs and more content for YouTube, which is where we are at this moment. At the end of the day, I ask myself this question daily. Joseph, what is your intention? And I always make sure that my intentions are not about me. I make sure that this project is a project whereby it helps people, it connects people, it solves a problem. It isn't just about me. And that's why I'm doing something remarkable for this video. Whatever revenue this video generates on YouTube, I've decided to give 100% of this revenue to one lucky subscriber. So all you have to do is hit the subscribe button. And for example, if we have 100,000 views, whatever revenue this be, the 100,000 views generate, I'm donating it back to a subscriber. If after two, three years, this 100,000 goes to, for example, a million, the extra revenue, I'll give it back to another lucky subscriber. For me, it's really not just, it's really not about the money. Yes, money is important. I'm not gonna lie to you as an entrepreneur. Without money, what we can do is actually limited. But it's never really about the money for me. It's about being able to make a difference. You know, while I did my shows, people came to me and were like, thank you for doing something like this. Because of this, I had a change of heart. Because of this, I'm taking my next step. Because of this, I'm able to do this. People, I could literally see people's lives change. I could see people's eyes light up when we made the show. Some people will say, we've never seen such affection, such love shared on a global level. And for me, it meant more than the money they paid for the tickets. In fact, I literally lost every time. I lost money every time I did the show. So it really isn't about money for me. It's about being able to make a difference and being able to change the world. I hope from this video, you all can take away the fact that our pains sometimes are meant to push us into our destiny. Yes, I wouldn't love to be attacked, but I wouldn't change anything that's happened to me because at the end of the day, I believe our greatest strengths are found in our weakest moments and our greatest pain actually pushes us into our greatest moments. Don't waste your pain. Together, Let's continue to save the nations, giving hope and providing solutions.